So, uh, so today I, I shall start the, the briefing the usual way about giving the overall, overall assessment of the situation, which uh, is, in our view, uh, still very serious at Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. But then, before uh, going into some more details, uh, you, I want to, to tell you, and you may have seen that, that uh, the fact-finding mission which has been sent to Japan, uh, well, they are probably at this time flying back home. Uh, they have concluded the first part of their work and they are now on their way home. The next part of their work will be to finalize and finally agree on the report which will be presented at the June conference. However, and you may have seen that on the IAEA website, it has pre prepared a preliminary summary which is available and I think it has been also uh, presented in Japan. Uh, this preliminary summary uh, was, uh, is to provide immediate feedback to the government of Japan. And uh, it's, it states a number of points of, uh, well, preliminary findings or recommendations, but again, this is uh, of a preliminary nature, and uh, we are expecting a substantial report by this mission uh, on the 20th of June by Mike Whiteman. Then, going to the Fukushima Daiichi plant status, uh, the tables which will be shown later by Javier Illera track progress made for each of units one to four towards fulfilling the three basic safety functions of the IAEA safety standards, uh, namely criticality prevention, removal of decay heat and mitigation of radioactive releases. These tables replace the three-color table that was used previously, and they are cross-referenced to the Tokyo Electric Power Company roadmap. On then some information, on 17th May, TEPCO provided a status report against the roadmap showing progress still st since the 17th of April. And while the basic policy and targets defined in the roadmap remain, several changes were made to account for new information obtained and progress made to date. On 13th May, TEPCO had commenced the preparatory work for the installation of a cover for the reactor building of Unit 1. And this reactor building cover will be installed as an emergency measure to prevent the dispersion of radioactive substances until mid to long-term measures are implemented. And uh, there was an important information uh, when TEPCO reported that uh, after calibration of the reactor water level gauges of Unit 1, uh, it showed that the actual water level in this reactor pressure vessel was lower than was indicated and showing that the fuel had been completely uncovered at some stage. The results of provisional analysis show that fuel pellets melted and fell to the bottom of reactor pressure vessel at a relatively early stage in the accident. And it was reported by TEPCO that most part of the fuel is now considered to be submerged in the bottom of reactor pressure vessel and some part exposed. TEPCO also reported that leakage of cooling water from the reactor pressure vessel is likely to have occurred. However, it considers that the actual damage to the reactor pressure vessel is limited on the basis of the temperatures now being measured around this reactor pressure vessel. And these results are provisional based on analysis, and TEPCO will continue to conduct investigations. 
Similar analysis will be conducted for units two and three when radiation levels allow calibration of the instrumentation. In unit one, nitrogen gas is still being injected in the containment vessel to reduce the possibility of hydrogen combustion inside the containment vessel. And in units one, two, and three, fresh water is being continuously injected via the feed water system lines into the reactor pressure vessel. Temperatures and pressures remain stable. To protect against potential damage as a result of future earthquakes, TEPCO started work on 9th of May to install a supporting structure for the floor of the spent fuel pool of Unit 4. And TEPCO has formulated the hypothesis that the damage to the Unit 4 building could have been caused by hydrogen generated at Unit 3 and leaked into Unit 4. And fresh water is still being injected as necessary into the spent fuel pools of unit one to four. Water supply for, from concrete pump trucks is being gradually replaced by the fuel pool cooling and cleanup system in units one to three. However, closed loop cooling has not yet been established. And stagnant water with high levels of radioactivity in the basement of the turbine buildings of units one and three is being transferred to the condensers, the radioactive waste treatment facility, the high temperature incinerator building, and temporary storage tanks. Stagnant water in the basement of the turbine building of unit six is being transferred to a temporary tank. Countermeasures against the outflow of water to the sea and to prevent and minimize the dispersion of radionuclides in water have been put in place. And full-scale spraying of anti-scattering agent is continuing at the site with the use of both conventional and, where necessary, remote-controlled equipment. As concerns now radiation monitoring, the daily monitoring of the deposition of cesium and iodine radionuclides for 47 prefectures is continuing. Since 17th May, deposition of iodine-131 has not been observed. And low levels of cesium-137 deposition were reported in a few prefectures on a few days since 18th of May. And the reported values range of between 2.2 to 91 becquerels per square meter for cesium-137. Gamma dose rates values for all 47 prefectures are reported daily by the Ministry of Education, Culture, Sports, Science and Technology, in short, MEXT of Japan. On 31st of May, the gamma dose rate reported for Fukushima Prefecture was 1.5 microsievert per hour. In all other prefectures, reported gamma dose rates were below 0.1 microsieverts per hour with a general decreasing trend. Meanwhile, the decrease of the gamma dose rate has slowed down since the short-lived radionuclides have already decayed away. Gamma dose rates are reported specifically for the monitoring points in the eastern part of Fukushima Prefecture for distances of more than 30 kilometers from the Fukushima Daiichi plant. And they show the general decreasing trend ranging from 0.1 microsievert per hour to 17 microsievert per hour, as reported for 31st of May. And on-site measurements at the west gate of the Fukushima Daiichi plant indicate the presence of iodine-131 and cesium-137 in the air in the close vicinity of the plant, approximately about one kilometer. The concentrations in air reported for 29th of May were about three becquerels per cubic meter for iodine-131 and about nine becquerels per cubic meter for cesium-137. 
And the values observed in the previous days show daily fluctuations with an overall decreasing tendency. As concerns protective actions, the, in April, the government of Japan had announced protective actions to reduce the external exposure to the population beyond a distance of 30 kilometers from Fukushima nuclear power plant. And NISA has reported that the evacuation of the planned evacuation zones within Itate village and Kawamata town commenced on 15th of May. Confirmation of completion of the evacuation is still awaited. Now if we go to marine monitoring. The marine monitoring program is carried out both near the discharge areas of the Fukushima Daiichi plant by TEPCO on 22 locations and at offshore stations by MEXT on 16 stations. The radioactive contamination of the marine environment had occurred, as has been already said, by aerial deposition and by continuing discharges and outflow of water with various levels of radioactivity from the four damage reactors at Fukushima Daiichi. The activity concentrations of iodine-131, cesium-134, and cesium-137 in seawater close to the Fukushima Daiichi plant at the screen of Unit 2 have been measured every day since the 2nd of April. And concentration of cesium-134 and cesium-137 decreased from more than 100 megabecquerels per liter initially to less than 5 kilo becquerels per liter on 7th May, but increased again to levels about 20 kilo becquerels per liter on the 16th May and 10 kilo becquerels per liter on the 17th. Since then, the concentrations dropped slowly to less than 2 kilo becquerels per liter. So there are fluctuations, and you will see that on, uh, on slides presented by Marina Bet Maria Betty. The variability of iodine-131 relative to the radio cesium concentrations could be an indication of retention of cesium by the zeolite sandbags in place, which would have almost no effect on iodine or further production of decay products in the reactor. Monitoring of the marine environment is performed by TEPCO on the near field area and by MEX at offshore sampling positions. <coughs> MEX monitoring includes also measurement of ambient dose rate in air above the sea, analysis of ambient dust above the sea, analysis of surface samples of seawater, and analysis of samples of seawater collected at 10 meters above the sea bottom and in a mid layer. On most of the offshore stations, iodine-131, cesium-134, and cesium-137 reached levels below the applied detection level of 10 becquerels per liter. And there will be a further decrease of the concentration during the propagation of contamination further into the sea. The activity found in surface sediments at the near shore stations close to the reactors was between 24 and 320 becquerels per kilogram for cesium-137 in the middle of May. And the activity in sediments decreases with distance, but is also highly dependent upon the type of sediment. And the contamination of marine sediments indicates that the enrichment of cesium and particulate matter and its removal from the water column into the sea floor. So we have cesium in the water column and then going into the sediments. Now if we go to the food monitoring and food restrictions subject, uh, food monitoring data were reported from 19th to 31st of May by the Ministry of Health, Labor and Wolf Welfare for a total of 818 samples collected in 18 different prefectures. Most of the monitoring continues to be concentrated in Fukushima Prefecture, where 
328 out of the 818 samples, which means over 40%, were collected. Analytical results for about 93% of these 818 samples indicated that cesium-134, cesium-137, or iodine-131 were either not detected or were below the regulation values set by the Japanese authorities. However, 52 samples were above the regulation values for cesium and or iodine. In Fukushima Prefecture, five samples of fishery products collected on 16th and 17th of May, one sample of unprocess unprocessed tea leaves collected on 17th May, three samples of shiitake mushrooms, nine samples of bamboo shoots collected on 19th May, and also five samples of seafood collected 20, 21, and 23rd of May, and one sample of Japanese apricot, also two samples of shiitake mushrooms, and seven samples of bamboo shoots collected on 26th of May were above the regulation values for cesium-134 and 137. And one sample of algae collected on 21st May was also above the regulations for cesium and iodine. In Chiba, Gunma, Ibaraki, and Tochigi prefectures, 18 samples of unprocessed raw tea leaves collected in, on 17th, 19th, 24th, and 26th of May were above the regulations for cesium-134 and 137. Now, as we go to food restrictions, uh, consolidated and updated information on food restrictions in Fukushima Prefecture were reported on 30th May by the Ministry of Health, Labor and Welfare, indicating that restrictions on the distribution of bamboo shoots were lifted in the Hiratamura area. However, restrictions remain in effect on, this, on the distribution of raw and processed milk, turnips, bamboo shoots, and ostrich fern in specific areas of prefecture. And restrictions on the distribution and consumption of sand lance fish in the whole prefecture and specific non-head type, I mean spinach, etc., and head type leafy vegetables like cabbage or broccoli, cauliflower, and shiitake mushrooms in specific areas of the prefecture also remain in effect. And in Ibaraki prefecture, there is a continuing restriction on the distribution of spinach produced in the cities of Kitaibaraki and Takahagi.